This episode is brought to you by AlphaSense, the AI platform behind the world's biggest investment decisions. The right financial intelligence platform can make or break your quarter. AlphaSense is the number one rated financial research solution by G2. With AI search technology and a library of premium content, you can stay ahead of key macroeconomic trends and accelerate your investment research efforts. AI capabilities like smart synonyms and sentiment analysis provide even deeper industry and company analysis. AlphaSense gives you the tools you need to provide better analysis for you and your clients. As yet another value podcast listener, visit alpha-sense.com slash FS today to beat FOMO and move faster than the market. That's alpha-sense.com slash FS. All right. Hello and welcome to the Another Value Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Walker. If you like this podcast, it mean a lot. If you could rate and review it wherever you're subscribing, watching, and listening to it, you know, five stars would be super helpful. With me today, I'm happy to have on Bill. I can't remember if it's the third time or the fourth time, but it's my friend, the, time. The, the king of public real estate, Bill Chen. Bill, how's it going? Fantastic. You know, uh, good to be on a pod again. Always uh, love chatting with you and uh, getting some, finally, some nice weather here in New York City. So I'm excited. This is the great thing about the pod because, you know, you and I, we text, we email, we DM, but it is nice to every now and then you forget like, hey, when's the last time I saw Bill's face and we got to talk about leg day and everything, but we're not going to talk about leg day today. Let's, uh, before we get started, just a quick disclaimer to remind everyone, nothing on this podcast is investing advice. That's always true, but particularly true today because Bill and I, you know, look, it has been a rough time for real estate over the past month, over the past year, over the past five years. And Bill, again, he is the king of publicly traded real estate. I think Bill is out here saying like, look, he's got some great stats. I might even be able to share some of the charts on Twitter when I post this, people can look for that. But he's got some great stats. And he's saying, look, the discrepancy between private market value and public market value is really high. If you look at history, if you look at the drawdown that you've had in REITs and everything, like now is really the time to be focusing on public real estate and Bill's trying to take advantage of that. And he wanted to come on to talk about that. So Bill, I kind of rambled with the overview, but I'll just turn it over to you. You know, what has happened to public real publicly traded real estate? Why do you think this is an opportunity? What is history telling us all of that? All right. Wonderful. Th thank you for the introduction, Andrew. Uh, it's been a, it's, it, this is, you know, as a value investor, this is kind of what I've been waiting for for 10 years. And and I just want to give some context, right? Uh, I started investing in public markets, a lot of fun t uh, 10 years ago in 2013. When at most, most you know, large cap multifamily reads that you look at were trading probably in the high threes, low fours cap rate, right? There was really no excess returns to be had uh, in that time. Fast forward 10 years later, finally, the Fed raised rates. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, since late 2021, the if you look at the FTSE NARI All Equity Re Index, which ex excludes mortgage REITs, we've had a 35 to 37% drawdown on the, not on total return basis, on a price basis. And one of the studies that we did with my, that I did with my analysts is that Every time that there's been a 30% drawdown in the, in the FTSE NARI index since going back to 1970, the, the forward returns for the next five years is 109%. So that is a phenomenal setup for stock picking within this space because, uh, you know, my, my strategy, half my strategy historically has been allocated to real estate. It's been very, very slim picking. You know, I've never looked at large cap uh, public REITs. And now I'm like a kid in a candy store. I mean, I'm just I'm just like looking at every single name I look at. I'm like, oh, I could buy, you know, multifamily, uh, some that multifamily large cap, you know, clean, excellent balance sheet. No, you know, no, no worries about debt maturities at 7% cap rate. Right. I could buy net lease. I could buy, you know, like like any really any any name out there, like any any of the big food groups within real estate. Uh, I, I get excited about. So this is, uh, you know. The, the draw, like we've definitely experienced drawdowns in our portfolio, but like the the opportunity set going forward is just so exciting. And, and Andrew, you can probably see it, you know, you can probably hear it in my voice, right? So I want to do, a, I want to dive into a couple different areas there. But so first, again, I think Bill said he's got this great uh, chart on the FT, the FC drawdown. If you're interested in it, I'll post it in, on Twitter. I think Bill said that was okay. So you can see this chart, but it's this great chart that goes back to the 70s that shows, hey, as Bill said, every time there's kind of a 30% drawdown, there's, <laughs> it spikes pretty quickly off that drawdown and pretty hard. And I just want to mention one thing on that drawdown. 
So I think people might think, oh, well, yeah, if you went back to 1980, right? And you said every time there's a 30% drawdown, it spikes up. People might say, yeah, but that's just kind of because you were riding the interest rate curves, right? Since from 1980 to kind of the end of last year, interest rates had always come down or been stable. So people might say, oh, it doesn't work in interest. And I think the interesting thing about this chart is it's no, like the first 30% drawdown is actually from September 1972 to May 1974. That is a rising interest rate environment. And the REITs, actually, it's the second best bounce that you've got on here. The REITs actually really outperform into that. So I, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but you know, I think the pushback here would be, oh, yeah, a lot of it is just, you know, you're in a declining interest rate environment. Of course, uh, real estate, which cap rates are very interest rate driven, of course, going to. I, mm. I think there is the 70s example, but I, I'll just let you take that overall. Sure. I mean, I think I think there is there's a lot more to. So 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 that I, I, I think you're very astute to point that out. Right. Uh, you know, because that period was from 72 to 74. And, and you know, the rates rise, like kind of going into the the eighties and and uh, you know peak peak in the early eighties right if I remember correctly and <clears throat> I think there's a lot more that goes into it uh in in uh, and and I've been doing real estate for twenty years between private and public and there, there's a lot more because you look at replacement costs and we we'll, we'll go into this I like, will go into this like through the course of the the podcast it's not just you know what's interest rate it's how much supply can you bring onto the market, right? How much supply can you bring onto the market? What is the replacement cost of these assets that you're going to buy? Are they going to be functionally obsolete? Like, is this a, you know, is this an asset class that has, you know, ter a long-term terminal value that will, you know, grow, call it, you know, at asset level two, three percent a year, right? Like, those are all really important factors. And, you know, we, we're in an environment today where, I track a lot of private real estate developers and they are not building that they're, they're not that what they're what they're telling me, you know, there's, there's a lot of antidotes, right? These are all antidotes, but there's a lot of them. And there's so many of them that that, you know, the, the low large numbers makes it statistically significant that what they're telling me is that they used to build, they used to build, uh, develop to a 6% cap rate, they would, you know, cash out refi, sell it at four and a quarter percent cap rate. And over four or five years, you know, using the financing rate, using what the bank will lend to them, they could get about a you know over twenty percent IOR using the same project, same return profile, but you raise the construction debt, uh, you know, debt, debt cost about from five percent all into about ten percent, and your loan to value goes from seventy percent down to sixty, and your exit cap rate is five percent. So, so like we're not talking about an exit cap rate of you know six percent or seven percent. We're talking about exit cap rate going from four and a quarter. To five percent, your IR goes to uh, something like six or seven percent, and what that tells me is that the, the, the developers cannot justify any sorts of development because if you could get, you know, as we speak today, four seven four eight in the ten year, right, or you know five five in the two year, like why would you why would you put up your capital and take on that much risk to to just you know earn six or seven percent IR, right? Like it, it just it, it doesn't make any sense at all. So so. Okay. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I love this. So on the supply side, what we're seeing is uh, like, you know, there, there was actually a couple of days ago, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal saying that the development starts for apartments have finally started to, you know, permits, you know, new starts have, have kind of come down uh, by a very, very dramatic amount. And if you look at the expected delivery, you know, going out in 25, 26, you know, that's, you know, there, there's a year where it's got to just fall off a cliff. Right. So. As someone who's been in this space for 20 years, both on the public side and private side, uh, this is this is a super fascinating time, right? Because these assets, if you if you're able to, uh, by the way, like like a little bit of historical context, just two years ago, these Sunbelt multifamilies on the private side were changing hands at like a three and a half percent cap rate, right? Like, and now they trade a seven percent cap rate. And for for the non real estate, you know, listeners to this pod, that's that's the same thing as something trading at 30 times cash flow to 15 times cash flow, right? I mean, it's a massive re-rating. Like it, it just, it's, it's, it may sound like just like little bips, you know, just three and a half percent, but you're actually taking an asset that trades at 30 times cash flow. Now you can buy it at 15 times. So if I'm just hearing all this, I think one of the cruxes of your thesis, which is not caught in the charts and which wouldn't get caught when people are only thinking of interest rates, but it's like, hey, look, okay, yes, maybe interest rates rise a little bit, but- the interest rate rise over the past 18 months, the the cutoff of, I mean, you can, I've looked at the banks very closely. All the banks are shutting down construction lending, right? Yep. Like the cutoff of this financing, you can't go do 
as you said, you, we've mentioned multifamily a lot, and I think multifamily is the one you're most attracted to. If yeah. I'm just kind of reading the tea leaves, but you can't go do a you know twenty million dollar multifamily apartment with all equity. You need a lot of debt in order to kind of juice yeah. the IRR. And the fact that all of this is getting cut down, they're like you're saying basically, hey, there's no supply coming online. Like a little bit more over the next twelve to eighteen months is the stuff that started two years ago gets finished. But if you fast forward to 2025, the past twelve months, especially six months nothing's been getting built. So mm. sure, you can say, oh, cap rates are going up, interest rates are going up. But if you look out 18 months, there might be a lot of pricing power is kind of what I'm hearing because that supply demand imbalance is going to get out of whack. And yeah, maybe in three years, we get another boom and people start building, but there's a lot of pricing power. Like the earnings are going to go up is one of the things I think I'm I'm kind of hearing from you is something that, again, it doesn't get caught in the charts, but that is on the back end that we'll have to settle up one way or the other. So no, that's I, I, Andrew. That's you, you. You you put that very very well, and that's exactly right. And just like to kind of, uh, you know, quantify kind of like you know how. So there is a lot of supply being bought online more than more than historical norms, right? Especially in the Sunbelt area, uh, and a lot of those. So a typical multifamily project, probably from the moment you decide to buy the land to when it actually gets delivered and bought onto supply uh, to the market is probably about four years at this point, right? Like, you know, in the past, and some of you probably could uh, bring it to market a little faster, but, you know, everything's gotten harder, right? Actually takes about four years. So if you think about all the projects that are being delivered, you know, 23, 24, 25. Uh, so I, I think the this elevated level of delivery is actually a little bit longer than 18 months. It's probably 24, right? But it really like, you know, really tells off, right? And the, But the, the thing is like, the longer that rate stays high today, the more, the more likely that, like, like, so, like, the delivery falls off a cliff, say in twenty six. What, what's going to happen is that the longer the rates stays in this kind of market condition, where nothing is approved, just think about like when they start building, it's going to be another four years before they can bring supply on online. So, like, that's really important, right? That's really important to understand is that is that you can't just flip a switch. Like, right? housing is not something that you could just flip a switch and everything just turns on. It's it, there's a four year lead time, so you're exactly right like we like you know we are I, 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 and, and like you know one natural question is like well why am i able to buy multifamily at a seven percent cap rate in the public markets like what, like am i the patsy right like like what am i missing i think if i learned one thing about public market andrew you could probably agree with me is that the public market do not want to hold anything going into a period where you either comp flat or comp slight negative like there's you know the headlines just don't look great now like are you know where I come from? We we what we tr like people joke about like oh like you know private market strategy or private equity strategy in public market, but like that's literally what what we do. This is these are you know caught you know hundred year assets, right? I'm not gonna like look at I'm not gonna look at what's gonna happen next year, the year after. I'm gonna look at like you know what these assets are worth three years, five years, ten years, twenty years out, right? And I think this is. A kind of like a once in a decade opportunity for me to be able to deploy a lot of capital into a space that's that's trading at a like on a dollar per unit, on a dollar per square foot, on a cap rate, on a uh, free cash flow, on a dividend yield. You know, like you, you, you look at all these metrics, man. This is this is like the best that I've seen in a decade. And now a quick break to remind you that this episode is brought to you exclusively by AlphaSense, the AI platform behind the world's biggest investment decisions. AlphaSense gives you the tools you need to provide better analysis for you and your clients. As yet another value podcast listener, visit alpha-sense.com slash FS today to beat FOMO and move faster than the market. That's alpha-sense.com slash FS. So I, I'm just taking notes because there's a lot of I, I want to follow up, up on mm. there. But uh, let, let me start with so yeah one of the one of the theses is and we, we can go into different pieces. But uh, you know I, I see some of your other slides and stuff here, and we can talk to specific public markets in a second. But I, I think the overall thesis and you laid it out right. If you go private market value right now, yeah. if you and I we threw together ten or twenty million <laughs> and we wanted to go buy a apartment building in Kansas City right for ten million dollars, we'd probably pay about a 5% cap rate, right? And yeah, you know, we probably, we, I, I actually do want to talk about debt and funding and everything, but we'd probably pay a 5% cap rate. And mm -hmm. if we go, if you and I went and bought it in the public markets through Avalon Bay or EQR, we can name a couple of different names, yeah. we'd pay a 6 or 7% cap rate. And mm -hmm. as you said, 
you might say, oh, 1% cap rate, that's not yeah. that big deal. But, you know, 5 versus 6% is actually a huge deal, right? Like that's a 20% yeah. increase in multiple if you kind of flip it around. So yeah. that is a big deal. I, I, I want to push back on that. And I've had you and Hawkins on here a few times, and I've always tried to dance around it. But I was really thinking last night about how I wanted to ask this question. So uh, let me try this. The thesis here is this mm -hmm. trades below private market value, right? Mm -hmm. And I have two questions on that. And the first is, are we falling into, there's just a lot of publicly or privately traded real estate. Like there's in America, there's thousands of apartment buildings that are worth $10 million, right? Mm -hmm. There's five cable companies that are worth $10 billion or something, right? And yeah. I think a cable company, like all cable companies, I'm using cable, but you could apply this to any public stock. Like mm -hmm. every stock is worth more. John Malone has said every stock is worth more dead than alive. And what he means yeah. is, if you sell them, they're going to go for more than they trade in the public market. So, you know, a cable company might trade for eight times. And if one got taken out, it'll probably get taken out for 10 times. And the day it gets taken out, maybe all the peers trade for eight and a half times, but they don't trade to the private market value, right? Because they're public costs. I guess what I'm wondering is, hey, are we just looking and saying, and now real estate is a lot more liquid than a public market, right? You can sell mm -hmm. an apartment building to 5,000 different buyers. Yep, you can sell yep. a cable company to maybe three <laughs> different buyers. So there is yep. a more of a liquidation opportunity there, but yep. are we just looking and ignoring that, hey, like public market things just tend to trade for less than they're worth in a private market full sale value? So, so this is super fascinating, right? Because like, like if you if you go back and, 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 and I love this topic, right? If you go back to... Uh, David Swinson, right? Like, you know, the, uh, the, the Yao endowment, um, the, you know, he coined the term, the, uh, the liquidity premium, right? Like there was a period where if you're public traded, you're liquid, you deserve a premium. And we like turn that upside down, right? Like th now it's like nobody wants a volatility and you got guys like Cliff Asness out there saying like, you know, private equity is basically your volatility longer, right? Like they launder your volatility. Um, and, and like it seems like a lot of these, uh, you know, everything in the public trades at a discount to private, right? Now, I would. W w this is where, uh, and, and th this is like the added optionality to this return stream, right? Like I think the public tends to overshoot on the way up when things are good. It tends to overshoot, and then it tends, uh, you know, tends to overshoot on the downside as well, right? Now we're we're trading below, right? Now we're trading. What we're trading below, like what, the, like way below what the privates are trading at, right? Um, and then I, I really do think that, and, and because the big guys, right? Like I've been, I've been on your pop before. I pitch, you know, FRP. I pitch, you know, others. Like there's these kind of some of the parts, like a little bit cats and dog, right? Like you know, FRP's like daily liquidity is, uh, um, you know, trade volume is like a million dollars a day, right? Versus like I could go out and I could buy, you know, Mid America and then Camden and and they, you know, like I could put a ton of capital, like like you know, like tens of millions of dollars, and 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 it won't like push the price around, right? Yep. There's real like liquidity, like when the market wants to express that trade. There's real liquidity premium. Like the market will pay, uh, you know, uh, a, a a premium for that kind of liquidity to be able to go in and out, right? So, 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 and and you kind of saw this. You you saw this in late 2021 when uh, in late 2020 coming out of COVID, right? Like when the market decided, hey, rates are low, interest rates are low, and we like want that exposure. We want to express that trade. You know, all these reads like you know took off, right? And they were like the small caps kind of got left behind. So. From where I was coming from, like I agree with you, like some of the small small market cap, less liquidity, a little bit of cats and dogs, some of the parts dynamic, like they kind of perpetually trades at a discount. The the big guys, like they could trade at a premium at times. It, it it's just one of the things like if if and when you and I were talking two years ago, you know, nobody envisioned a world where you know 10, 20 year treasuries were back up to five percent two years from now, right? And it, it's very easy to say, oh, for the past two, three years, yeah. as you said, if it's a we know that e-liquid kind of higher stuff is going to trade at a discount. But, you know, for the past two years, three years, it's been like, oh, Avalon Bay, New York City office space, whatever it is, trades for a discount to the private market value. And it's mm -hmm. easy to feel like that goes on forever. But Hawkins, who came on and pitched VNO, like one of the things he talked about was, hey, you know, people are like, oh, 10 years up to 4%. Aren't these office buildings, shouldn't they trade at a, bit, a premium to that? And in today's environment, maybe. But if you go back to like the mid 2000s, office traded at a 3% cap rate while the 10 year was at four or 5%, right? Like yeah. they have traded inside the 10 year before. And as you're saying, if you go back and this is before the financial crisis, 
look, 20 years ago, you got a premium for liquidity, right? All, yep, all these yep. publicly traded guys would trade at 4% and private market would be 5%. And all the private markets, this is why a lot of them are publicly traded. All the private markets would be like, our one goal is to get big enough and go public. And then we're going to get a 20% bigger multiple. So like, it sounds crazy to say this today, but regimes change, things change. And right now, yes, you're getting a huge discount when you, but as you said, like, could the discount get wider? Maybe, but you know, it probably shouldn't be this wide. And it wouldn't surprise me if we did this podcast 10 years from now and you were like, look, now is the time to sell all your public market and go into the privates because public markets trades at five and privates are trading at six. Go take advantage of that spread. Well, you know, it's it's interesting that you mentioned that, like, and, and I've seen a few cycles, right? Like I've seen, um, you know, I've been involved in real estate post 9-11. That's when my family first started buying into uh, the kind of residential buildings in New York City. I was at City during the GFC, and I, you know, like I was following the market, kind of like coming out of GFC, and you know, I've been through COVID, so like I've been through three really big cycles, right? I, I have a lot of memories about the market, and it's just what you mentioned that because like if you want to get like really cute, I would say like if your family office or like your your large investor and you like want to like kind of play this the right way. You could like allocate capital to a large liquid uh, uh, multifamily REITs, right? When that worked, that's also your signal. Hey, like maybe you want to take some chips off the table and do the private trade next because on the way down, the private lags. It's been lagging by about, you know, like, because, like, you know, the public sold off around April of last year, right? And, 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 you know, the private really didn't move. Uh, like the private's like lagging about, you know, 12 months behind, right? So like on the way out, like, it, you know, my, my experience, you know, what I, my memory of history is that that's got the same thing's going to happen. So like they're, they're like, you could kind of set that up. Like if you like, maybe we're getting like a little bit too cute here, but like you could set up where you, 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 you're getting on the publics that re-rates when that, when that works, like you still will, will have a lot of capital to put into the private side. Like that's like, you know, high level, like, no, you know, I hear you. It, it's, it's very difficult to pull off, but I do think there is something to like, the public markets are very fast moving. And look, it, to be, go back, if we were dealing with $2 billion, uh, you know, private equity deals, they would be very fast moving as well. But when you're dealing with a, a lot of these apartment buildings, 10, 20, 50 million, not that it's not sophisticated people, but they're probably not as fast on the day to day. So as you're saying, like the private, the publics might sell off. This public sold off in April because they saw the stock, they saw interest rates going up. Yeah. You know, if you were a doctor who had been making deals, uh, making money on these deals, you might not have responded quite as quickly. So as you're saying, like maybe in July of last year, you could have sold something to them at a three and a half percent cap rate while on the public. It was saying, hey, this is six. Let me go to my my next piece of pushback yeah. on the, hey, the public market trades below the private market. And, yeah. and this is the other one that really struck me. Yeah. If you and I went and bought an apartment building in the private markets, right? Yeah. We could really optimize it in a lot of ways. The first way would be, we would pub put it into a partnership structure, right? Mm -hmm. You and I, we'd get all sorts of bonuses. We'd get depreciation. We get all. We would not be paying any tax on this, right? And now, mm -hmm. a lot of the public traded guys, yes, they're REITs, so you're yeah. not getting the the curse of the double taxation, right? Where they're a C corp and then you pay taxes on that as well. But they can't pass on all of that depreciation and all of that those tax advantages to their investors, mm -hmm. right? They they literally just pay out the REIT dividends and then you and I pay the dividend, right? So. Yeah. This does come back a little bit to, hey, things in the public have traded at premiums before, but why shouldn't public market real estate trade at a discount? Because it's just disadvantage, right? It, you don't get the tax benefits. You have to pay tax on the dividends. Like private market stuff kind of should trade for a discount when you kind of think about that. And just one more thing on that. If you and I bought the apartment building, we would completely tr control capital allocation. And I'll come back to that in a second. But you know, when we buy into one of these REITs, it is a REITs are actually, they're very difficult to go activist on. You're kind of trusting the management on capital allocation. You, they can't time to sell. You know, so yeah. when I wrap that whole thing, I'm like, yeah, like I'd honestly rather just go, not that I can afford an apartment building, but yeah. I, it would be way better for me. I pay a premium to buy an apartment building myself versus to kind of have it in a publicly traded structure where I can't control it. So I'll, I'll, I'll toss all of, I threw a lot of that. But <laughs> no, I mean, and, and, and look, I, I love this conversation, right? I love this discussion. And we, we looked at it. I think the ability to take distribution, like to shield your distribution by buying the building and using, you know, depreciation to shield your cash distribution. Like that is the most legitimate, you know, argument against owning in the public, right? Like that's, that's legit. Absolutely. Now, you know, 
uh, outside and, and then like there's things you could do where like you could like uh, like if you do sell you could like 1031 it right and then like you kind of like create this perpetual machine right now that that is and and i you know like my family's done that on the private side like you know like i i personally own uh, real estate so i'm, I'm totally aware I'm you, right? if i ever run for president one of my core tenants is going to be we're getting rid of 1031 because it's absolutely <laughs> ridiculous the gifts that we give to real estate i understand anyone who invests in real estate is going to invest against me but we're getting rid of that man that is okay. that is so crazy that real estate investors get that uh you know apparently the history started with like like farmers like 10 30 wanting like cattle like like it's like like kind of exchange and you don't want to like you know have some farmer who like you know they sell like some young cattle exchange for like some older cattle or like like i like i like i, I think that's like the history right that, like that's the, interesting i get it but you know i've tried yeah. to say hey i i bought a stock that start i bought a stock that started with B and then I sold it and bought another stock that started with B and they have not let me 1031 those capital gains. So <laughs> that's, I think, I think that's, that's like, you know, a whole separate topic that, that that's probably safe for like, you know, a whole different day. Right. Uh, but uh, let, let, let me address like, so the tax advantage of like owning private real estate, like that's, that's very real, right? Like, um, and, and, you know, but if you think about what do you get, what are the advantages when you actually own it through the public uh, real estate, right? Like liquidity is like a bad word right now, right? But liquidity is a real advantage. Like the fact that like, like in a moment's notice, you get in and out of things, right? Like that deserves a real premium, right? The second part is like, you know, like the actual management of the real estate asset net, like Andrew, like, you know, like it's, it kind of sounds awesome to sit here and say like, I'm going to go out and buy this and blah, blah, blah. Right. Like, like I've gotten phone calls from my tenant, like when a blizzard rolls through and the heat doesn't work and guess who's got to drive in like a foot of snow, like to, to, to the place and turn on the furnace. Cause like you could call people, but you know, like the guy who's going to do that, he's busy. He's got, he's got a dozen calls. Right. So like, I got to go do that. Right. And my wife's parents own a few apart apartments in Utica, New York. So if anybody's looking to live in beautiful Utica, New York, but they're, you know, they're getting older. And I'm always like, guys, I understand, like, this has created a lot of wealth for you, it generates income and everything. But, you know, how many times is Toddy Tubis going to drive to an apartment at, you know, two in the morning because he gets a call from the tenant and they say, hey, the pipes froze, the toilet's not working or something like that. That is a real headache that, as you're saying, in the public markets, like, I don't get calls from my stocks at two in the morning that say, hey, uh, <laughs> you know, there's an issue. We, we're going to need you to drop everything and come in like somebody else is doing that. It's certainly a bonus. Yeah. And, and then like, let's keep going down the list, right? Like, um, that, so diversification. Right. Like if you if you buy MA and CPT, I mean MA has got like almost a hundred thousand uh units, you know, that's that's um uh you, you know a ton of buildings spread out over multiple cities, right? But you own a single building, but now if you just happen to own a building like where a hurricane comes through in Florida, like you have a hundred percent loss like uh risk, right? Like you have sinkhole risk, you have all these risks, right? So you, or, you get a it's a great you know, everybody loves to buy homes. And my pushback has always been, yeah, like I'm getting old, I'm about to have a kid, I will probably buy something at one point. But everybody says, oh, it's this great source of wealth generation. And okay, yes, you, like there are nice tax breaks and stuff. But what about think about the people who bought homes in Detroit in the 80s. And we're mm -hmm. like, this is the best. Like we've got all the automakers here, football, like we've got all the big four sports teams like this city's never going to go bad and you were probably so far underwater on that thing 20 years later like you take very like that is a very real risk new york city i don't think san francisco apartments would be great you bought one there i bet yeah. you are killing yourself and six years ago you would have been like big tech this is the bit new york yeah. city I, I i do still have some worries about a doom loop at some point with you know subway ridership down 30 percent and service getting cut off but it, it's just a fantastic point you you get diversification get across all of america when you buy into one no you could you could potentially like you know allocate to the run geographic exposure right so like like you still gotta be careful about that but like i think i think on the single like you, you know, like, like if you got exposures in Nashville, Miami, like Dallas, you know, Phoenix, et cetera, et cetera, like there's like 10 different markets. And then there's literally like, you know, several hundred buildings. Like there's nothing that like could potentially take you out. Right. Uh, you know, at one point, my family put half our net worth in our first investment property. I mean, that was really scary. Right. Something happened to that one building. It was three rental units. If something happened to that building, like like we we, we were out of half of our life saving. Right. So. So I, I think I think that's very legitimate. But like you know, one thing that people don't really talk about is like 
transaction fees, right? Like, like Andrew, like how much you pay Interactive Broker to buy a single share? Like a penny? Yeah. Right. A penny, a penny on a hundred dollars stock. I mean, I, I, I don't even know. Like that's not even, that, that's like not even one basis point, right? Like, is that one basis point? Like, like you can't do the math right now, but like, like anytime you buy and sell real estate, I mean, it's fair to say like on a larger asset, like 3% all in transaction costs. Right now let's like actually walk through the math, right? Let's walk through the math. If you're putting say 60%, like 70% leverage, right? If you're putting 70% leverage, which like was like kind of what, what was normal, your equity is 30% of like, if you buy a multifamily building for hundred million dollars, right? That's the $30 million equity check. Your transaction cost is $3 million to go in. At some point you got to get out, right? So 10%, almost 10% of your equity goes toward transaction fees and you got to make that up in your return somewhere. You, you you could you could log into interact brokers or really like any any any, any brokerage that you have. Your transaction cost is one basis point. Like I think Jake Taylor at you know Jake Taylor one time on Thanksgiving says something along the line like he's like he's thankful for fractional ownership through the stock market and, and like it really resonated with me right like it really resonated with me because like you got all these like crypto people running around talking about like we're gonna like revolutionize like. Uh, like, you know, real estate ownership and do all these things and like all these protocols. I'm like, guys, it's called REITs. <laughs> like, like, you get a fractional ownership, like all oh, this protocol. And, 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 you know, like, I think a lot of times people push back on, oh, you know, like these public traded companies, the CEOs are just like watching out for themselves. If anything, I've yelled at more like public traded CEOs, <laughs> like, like and, and not yelled at, but like I've, I've given them like more like, hey, you should do this, you should do do, do that, right? And I think when you get to, I, I think like in the deep value world, there's a lot more like you got to engage with management team. You got to like, you know, really like tell them, hey, this, you know, like, like I like what you're doing here. You don't like what you're doing here. Like you really should buy back shares. Like there's a lot, like you got to really just be a lot more active. The larger public trader reads, I mean, the shareholder base essentially kind of gave them a blueprint, right? You got to keep debt, you know, net debt to EBITDA like below six times, right? Like can't go over six times. You got to ladder your debt maturity. Like if you look at, if you look at the debt maturity of uh, ladder, right? Like the, the maturity wall of uh, mid America, it's like, it's like space out every year for the next 10 years, very well ladder, right? And uh, like like all the, the large public reads are just so much better at at you know all these things like and and they understand like if they trade at a premium they'll issue equity to go buy you know privates right and you know another thing is like you, every private guy that I'm talking about like like that I'm tracking or talking about they're worried about surviving they're worried about like you know making enough payments they're worried about like you know do we have enough capital to to cover capex all the big guys i was at nary in june all the big guys are talking about they're like rubbing their hands together they're like aha like we, we may have a distress cycle coming up and we want to buy you know we, like we want to buy from distressed developers we want to buy from like people who 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 has a maturity come due balloon maturity come due and they, they're forced to sell right like and that's a dynamic right so there's the there's the you know what like your transaction costs uh, like going in and out like what it costs you like buy an asset sell an asset like it costs you nothing right it costs you like nothing and at yeah no I, I would just add like you, you very astutely pointed all that out the, like, the other thing is it costs you nothing in terms of all those expenses but think about the time you know if you and I were going to buy an apartment building like we'd have to go identify the building we'd have to work with the brokers now maybe you could say all right Bill and Andrew like. Andrew, you're comparing to do it yourself. You could go work with the manager, but you know the manager is going to take what two and twenty if we work with them. So yeah, we can outsource a lot of that time, but the manager is going to take two and twenty. We will get the tax benefits we talked about when he yeah. uh, passed them through, but two and twenty is a lot more than what you pay in MAA or like if I remember correctly, they just pay their managers like you know normal managers. They don't get yeah. huge incentive fees that take up twenty percent of the upside. So you get that the, the taxes are. You don't get the tax breaks, but the taxes are simpler, right? You're just going to pay taxes on your dividend. Whereas if you go buy, you know, if we wanted the diversification that one of these went, we'd have to go buy apartment buildings, what, 10 different states, 20 different states. So yeah. we're probably going to have to file state filings in 20 different states. Like you, there, there are simplification advantages there, not just in terms of the expenses, but also in terms of just the, the time cost. Oh, I mean, like, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of debate with like um, certain like private, um, I think like, if you have um, an organization, right, where you have real estate expertise, you have an 
a, a team and an organization, right? And you, this is your expertise, right? I think like you you could like do it, achieve you. You have a lot more control. But like if you're a passive investor, like if you're a family office and you're let's say in some sort of a opera, you, you make widgets, right? And you want to diversify and have exposure to to real estate, like most likely you're gonna have alloc you're gonna allocate it to a uh, you know private manager. Who you know? If you, if you think about like, there's a one to two percent management fee, and then there's a certain promote over a hurdle, right? And then you know, there's like the industry has a practice where they tend to tack on. There's like construction costs. There's some sort of like we're doing some sort of value add, right? There's like a bunch of fees. Like if you look at a fee schedule of private real estate deals, like it, it could get like like it, sometimes it get like pretty egregious. So now there's some really good operators, like people that I follow on Twitter that are that are very very fair with their fees, right? Uh, but I think the industry as a whole on the private side, like the fees that they charge, like Kato makes the, the hedge on the strategies look like choir boys, right? So so I think when you look at, you know, we, we looked at like the MAA's like SGNA expense, right? And and the way that I think about it is that their SGNA expense is kind of like setting up the infrastructure to be able, uh, they're like 30 basis point of market cap, like SGNA expense per year is what provides you to be able to go in and out, right? That pays for the management, pays for like managing all these assets and making all these strategic decisions, right? And and in that, like when you compare that to one to two percent of like management fee, it's actually much, much cheaper, right? But and you know, as you said, 30 basis points versus one or two percent. And they're going to do 20% incentive fee on the upside. There's probably like waterfall and stuff, but all, you you all in that, I I think it's pretty safe to say you're probably paying 15 times more on the private side than the public side. Well, I, I don't know, because what does yeah. B-REIT charge? Just to, to turn it what every, do you know what B-REIT charges? I think I think B-REIT is around 1% 1 or maybe 1.5%, but like okay. B-REIT, B -REIT, I believe has like kind of like a sales load, like a mutual fund and, and that. I, I think that's correct too, yeah. but I, I don't, I would not stake my reputation on it. Let me just turn to capital allocation. Actually, actually do, you mind, like, do you mind if I like, there's like two other things that I want to yeah, like, yeah, go, bring go, go, up. Go, go. What, one of it is like your, your financing costs, right? Like let's say you, Andrew and I went out to the, to the private market and we bought a building at a 5% cap rate, right? The, the problem is that like, we got to go get new debt at five and a half percent today. Right. When you buy through the public markets, you're buying it's it's almost like you're getting assumable mortgages, right? Like this is a huge edge. Like not only are you buying at a seven percent cap rate today, you're getting you're assuming that debt structure, which you know, a lot of it is is actually about like, you know, if you look at MAA, like their secured debt is is four four, unsecured debt is actually three four, right? Like yeah, I, I, <laughs> it's funny you mentioned MAA because I'm looking at their 10Q right now. Four yeah. billion dollars of debt uh, of fixed rate notes due 2029. Weighted yeah. average cost three point four percent. Fixed rate yeah. property due 2048. 4.4 percent. Unfortunately, there's only like 360 million of it, but that yeah. you know <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's it's like you, you kind of have like a time machine trade, right? Like you're you're. You're buying into it. You're buying into it at some cap today, but you get to assume the historical, the existing, you know, structure. And and like uh, on the private side, like what's like even more nuanced is like sometimes like every time you do a transaction, the the property tax, like the state property tax division, knows what your assets are worth, right? So you get a huge bump up in property tax. Your re insurance reprice when you buy into the public REITs, you, it, they don't. They generally don't reprice, right? This is something like like if you really get deep into the weeds, like. The, uh, you know, a lot of the private guys like like understand those lines. So, so these are all the advantages of owning it through the uh, through the public REITs. Uh, so, just let, let, st actually sticking with debt because that's one of the things I wanted to mention with capital <laughs> allocation here, right? Yeah, so, yeah. sticking with debt, one of the things I do look at and I say, uh, MAA, you know, yeah. they've got four point two billion dollars in net debt and a market cap of a little over fifteen or fifteen. So, let's just say twenty percent of their EV is debt, right? Yeah. If you and I went and bought property, apartment buildings, right? Yeah. I don't think we'd be running these at 20% net debt. Like, correct me if I'm wrong, 50% net debt, 60% net? Oh, it, it, it could. I mean, I've seen people go up to like 80, right? It's like it, what the what the bank's appetite are, right? So, we do, yeah. Now, if we didn't fix that, like a lot of the sun belts are blowing up. At, we'll, we'll talk to stress cycle in a second, but uh, you yeah. know, if we didn't- yeah. 80% debt and we didn't get it fixed and interest rates go from zero to five. Like that's why a lot of these guys are getting in trouble. But yeah. uh, you know, just speaking, sticking to the inefficiency, because you mentioned, yeah. right? Pu publicly traded shareholders have told these guys, hey, yeah. five times debt to EBITDA, six times debt to EBITDA, that's your limit. Don't go above it. 
And that's great in terms of conservatism, but just going with the inefficiency, like if I'm competing against private market guys who are going to slap 60% debt onto something and I can only slap 20%, like I'm going to get it outbid for everyone. Maybe that works in a distress cycle because I've got a cleaner balance sheet, but it just seems very inefficient to me. Okay. And, and, and that's, that's, that's the thing is that, right? Like, you know, the whole Buffett when, you know, when the tie goes out, you know, who's been swimming naked, right? Like, you know, I, I think like if we fast forward a few years, like it, 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 it probably, I think we're going to find out that like, if you pay a three and a half percent cap rate, right? For a multifamily, that's probably not a good idea. And especially if you like, uh, you know, the worst thing you could do is if you if you borrow using all floating rate debt, which like, you know, there, there, there's 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 a firm out there called Tide Equity. You know, essentially, that's how they capitalize, uh, you know, their, their purchases. And they're in the news a lot. Right. And I don't want to pick on them uh, specifically, but there's a lot of the same examples. Right. And so so, you know, this is where this is what I've always been about in the public markets. And, and when in a in an environment where you know, interest rates, you know, stays the same or actually goes down, right? Like the guys running with 50 to 80% loan to value, like they look like geniuses, right? They look like geniuses because, because a 2% rent increase, if you put, if you put, um, you know, 70% loan to value on it, like that, that kind of translates to 6% increase in NOI. And then you get a multiplier effect, right? Like you, you get like a multiplier effect on the, on the, on the cap rate, right? Like it, it could like really magnify itself, right? So, so, you know, we're having like a tie going out moment, right? And, and yes, like, like the 20% is, is not as attractive, right? Uh, but like it's, it's very conservative. It's very, uh, uh it's very well protected. Like, I don't know what happens in the next two years, but I sleep really well at night knowing that there's no near-term maturity on these companies that's going to take them out. They have just like between the net operating income, the revolver capacity that they have. And, you know, the CEOs are like, like they could, they could handle all the maturities for like the next like five to 10 years. Right. And, and that is not like, that's a very enviable position. Now, the other thing that has happened is that rent has actually gone up significantly. So, so like, what I was saying about like, you know, the, the shareholders telling these companies, hey, you know, you can't like, you know, you, you should have run with that much leverage, right? Like you should run with low leverage. But if, if you look at like, you know, what rent was in 2019 to now, right? They've gone up like net operating income has gone up significantly, right? So they, they had a certain, you know, net debt to EBITDA metric that's now actually much, much lower, right? So, so and, and that's a function of huge, you know, rent growth and huge, you know, NOI growth, right? So there, you know, that 20% is one is not the norm, right? It's actually, it's actually a, a, an effect of tremendous rent growth and tremendous growth in the NOI, right? So, so like kind of, so there's like, you kind of think of it, they could probably take that, they could probably take that up to 35, 40%, right? And, and, it, and it's just like the recent rent growth has, and, and, and that's like kind of the inherent, like the hidden, the, like like what are the hidden um um uh, you know like like what what are the hidden um um uh, strength or optionality in these big public REITs right I mean they one they they could like issue you know take that leverage up buy a bunch of distressed assets right or maybe even like now we're getting to the point where like I personally told some of these CEOs I'm like hey you could buy distressed probably at a six cap right your own stock is trading at seven if you can't find you know, if you can't find, you know, distressed assets, you should just buy back your own shares. They didn't that, say yes. Actually, that, that, that was my next question. So I'll just jump in and ask it. Like, look, there. you mentioned earlier that the CEOs are at public trade conferences and kind of like, hey, we've got clean balance sheets. Like we certainly weren't swimming naked. We've got clean balance sheets. We're yeah. ready for a distress cycle. And I, I guess my two questions on that are, how would they finance a distress cycle? I think you said it sounds like they might just take leverage up, but you know, my worry would be you go and issue your stock, which is trading at a seven cap, to go buy quote unquote distressed at six point five caps when all the private markets at five and a half, and you're like, uh, well, you just deluded me from my seven cap. That's one. And yeah. then number two, you know, none of these companies, as far as I can tell, are buying back stock, yeah. and I, I not only buying back, but I was just flipping through the only company that even has insider buying. And as far as I can tell, is uh, MAA. They had yeah. a couple of small insider buys in August at prices that were about 10% higher. A, a director bought, it looks like a, a couple hundred thousand. So not meaningless, yeah. but you know, I, I just, I've seen industries where the market is implying distress before and there's yeah. no distress. And like 
Sometimes there's tons of insider buying. Sometimes there's not. But yeah. I just look at this and I say, no insider buying, no share buybacks. Like, are we really going to get that like real alpha return if these guys kind of aren't stepping on the gas here? Yeah. So sure. Yeah. I mean the. Um... Uh, so let me just, uh, uh, so the, the, you, you said a lot there and, uh, I had, a, I had an answer to it, but then like lost my thought. Um, let me see the, uh, so I, the, so it's, it's like how, how they, how they finance it. Right. Okay. So, uh, if you look at the payout ratio on the dividends, they're only paying out somewhere between like 67 to 73, like the, the four, the four big reads that I, they're only paying out. So there's a ton of capital being retained, right? So they could potentially buy distress, take advantage of distress there, but just by their free cash flow generation. Okay. And, and this is, you know, this is now paying their SGNA and then paying their maintenance capex, right? Uh, I mean, they, all these reads have some sort of development, like growth capex spent, right? But they have, so, so there, there, there's a ton of cash flow being, you know, not distributed to shareholders. So like, if you look at the dividend yield, you're like, well, Bill, like I'm getting in at like a four, two, four, three dividend yield. Like that doesn't seem attractive, but like the actual total, like the total available for distribution is actually about a six, six and a half percent yield, which is, which is, you know, a huge yield for, for REITs, right? They're not paying all that out that, you know, about a third of it being retained to be redeveloped, to be, you know, redeployed in the shape. The second thing is that the capital markets knows like they they don't have to issue equity. Like the capital markets are still open for the big large capital, you know, large cap reads. Like if you're looking to buy corporate bonds, right? Like you look at you know these uh, these you know large cap multifamilies that have over a billion dollars of net operating income, and literally like the net debt to EBITDA is like four times, right? And and if you like, we stress test what happened to NOI during the GFC. You want to take a guess, like how much the Sunbelt multifamily reads, like how much the NOI dropped. When? It, during the GFC. During the GFC. Sorry, I, I thought yeah. you might have said COVID. Uh, yeah, I, I, 2%, 3%, I, I guess it's like, not like, really big. Like, no, like, like, like it, it dropped like at most about 5%, right? And then it, it like, so unemployment went from about 4.5% up to 10%, and then it kind of came down a little bit, right? And and so like, you have you have that, like probably one of the most stressful time periods in, you know, in, in like the U.S., the, the world financial history in recent times, right? And NOI for you know like something like uh, for a company like Mid America only dropped by five percent, like you know like you know from start to like the the absolute trough, right? And then within like two years, like exceeded like the previous benchmark. Now, Avalon Bay got hit harder because they have more exposure to New York City, which is like in the center of like you know mortgage packaging, and like California was like so like uh, like Avalon Bay I think was like down you know mid to high teens NOI, right? So but like. What, what what I mean is that like the capital markets understand that these are these are essentially they're bonds, right? These are bond like vehicles. These are bond like instruments, and 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 they understand that like if they're carrying four times net debt to even that, like capital markets like willing to give these companies like another billion, another two billion. At probably you know when I was talking to CEOs back in you know in June, they were saying. The price is five percent now. You know, ten-year yields have gone up a lot since then. Maybe you tack on six percent, right? Like, so it's like, well, why would these guys like go issue new debt at six percent, go buy something at a six percent cap rate? I think it comes down to, hey, you know, a six percent fixed rate debt, it, you know, stays at six percent. But you know, if you buy multifamily over ten years, you're going to have some real asset appreciation, real cash flow growth, right? And, and, and that comes back to what we started, like one of the original things we said, right? Where yeah, right now over the past twelve months. The supply is getting cut off and you won't see you won't see that popping up today really you won't see that popping up next year but two or three years from now you could have a shortage and as yep. you said if you buy it six percent now you find into six percent debt a you get the tax deductibility of the debt which is always nice but b yep. you know in two or three years you could really start seeing some really nice growth obviously you should even without that supply driven shortage growth you should yep. just get inflation growth right which you should tack yep. on one, yeah. two in 2022, nine, who knows, yeah. percent growth. But uh, just to go back, the, the lack of insider buying and the, yeah. the buybacks, I, I just want to address those real quick. Yeah, I mean, I think like at the at the large, you know, at the large cap REITs, like I don't I don't view that as like a strong signal one way or another. Like, like I think I think like in some of these smaller companies, like you, uh, like, you know, I view that more of a signal and uh, I, I'm, I'm going to trust like my own experience here and my own gut that it, like 
REIT buybacks generally is not, it's just like very, very rare, right? Like REIT, REIT buybacks is like very rare. And, yep. and if you like own a company, if you own a REIT and, and, and the management team suck buying back, that is like, that is a major, major bullish signal, right? Now it, 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 it it's just like magnified probably 10 times of like a normal operating company because like REITs are not set up. They're more set up to issue to issue equity than 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 to um, now if they issue it at the right cap rate and right multiple like it could be very very creative right so so generally like you know just generally don't buy back shares right uh, and then, like in, ter in terms of insider like if you're a fifteen billion dollar like market cap company where like the, it, you're not the founder like you're 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 like a C level executive like you're really making your returns I mean I know like from from like a deep value value investor perspective doesn't like this this isn't like a satisfactory answer but the reality is that like hey these are stewards like these these ceo c-level executives are kind of there to like you know manage operate right like they're they're like asset level managers right like like whether they buy whether they buy stock or not buy stock like like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna pin like my you know my investment decision on whether they do that or not and now a quick break to remind you that this episode is brought to you exclusively by AlphaSense, the AI platform behind the world's biggest investment decisions. AlphaSense gives you the tools you need to provide better analysis for you and your clients. As yet another value podcast listener, visit alpha-sense.com slash FS today to beat FOMO and move faster than the market. That's alpha-sense.com slash FS. No, I, I certainly hear you. And I, I'm just flipping through the Avalon or sorry, the, the mid-American apartment communities uh, proxy. I'm like, look, the CEO, he owns $50 million worth of stock. He gets paid about $8 million a year of which, you know, seven, four million is stock comp and $3 million is non-equity incentive pay. So his base salary is less than a million. You know, so he's, yeah. he's pretty motivated. He's got a stock motivation. It's it just, it's a little disappointing to me where, you know, you see these guys. <laughs> be, yeah. And this is, I think you and me as value investors who like, we make our money because we own the stock and the stock yeah. goes up. Like, that's the only way we make our money. I do think there can be something like, hey, you're a financial guy. Like, yeah, you want everybody to spend every dime they make on the company being on your side. Like, he is probably pretty properly motivated. But, you know, it's just one of those things. That's Well, Andrew, Andrew, I mean, here's another stat that's crazy for you, right? Like, like you say, like. You know, a lot of returns come from like the um, the stock going up, right? Like, so another stat that we, we looked at is uh, my, my analyst and I went back to 1970 and the total return, um, the total return, because REITs pay a higher dividend, right? I think, I think like the total price return since like 1970 might've been like, like seven times, but the total return, like, like the price return might've been like seven times for the index, but like the total return was actually 200 X because of all the dividends that you got, you know, the S and P generally is below 2% dividend yield. Right. And right now the re dividend yield is hovering probably around 5%. So dip, like a little bit of dividend goes a really, really long way towards your total return. Right. So there's like a different way of like, you know, becoming wealthy in, in, in read and real estate game. So I'm glad you mentioned total return and the S&P yeah. and REIT dividend, right? So yeah. I, that actually is the last area I wanted to see. Now, yeah. obviously you are, you're saying like, hey, this is the time for real estate right now, yeah. right? And it, it's, when we started, you mentioned the last decade, like I, I had a, a tweet, it was almost, we've had a last decade, but it, the stocks are up a little bit over the last decade. But for publicly traded real estate, it's been like a la lost half decade, right? The, yeah. the VNQ, which I think is a, a decent proxy is up. 12% total return over the past five years, not annualized 12% yeah. total return. Right? 12%, yep. You actually would have done better parking your money in T-bills, but I, there, my pushback there would be, Hey, yeah, Bill, I understand what you're saying, but we are yeah. talking public markets, right? And yeah. guess what? You know, what's underperformed the VNQ, the IWM, the Russell 2000 over the past five years, the total return is 10%. So both of them, you know, the annualized return rounds to 1%, but I, IWM is actually a little lower. So I guess my last pushback here, and then I want to talk a couple individual names and then we'll run it. Oh, my last pushback would be, hey, I understand, okay, maybe publicly traded real estate looks cheap against private market real estate. And I'm yeah. not asking, I'm not asking in terms of, hey, can you and I go find if we spend all of our time one stock of the thousands of stocks that is not real estate that is, yeah. you know, more undervalued than just publicly traded real estate in general. I'm just asking the opportunity cost of real estate versus we can invest on in a lot of other stuff. Yeah. You know, why why? real estate versus, you know, the Russell in general 
Or okay. we could go do MLPs, which take oil and gas risk. But, you know, those yield, yeah. but those have some pretty juicy returns. Like, yeah. why specifically private real estate versus, I know you look at stuff other than real estate too, versus just kind of the general overall equity indices. Sure. So I think the... Um... There, there, there's a few there, there's a few uh reasons right number one i think the most important and, and we, we didn't like really get into it is that like we have an, we have internal models on like what the expected returns are going forward buying something like an maa and cpt right like if we now your exit cap rate assumption is is a huge deal right so let's just go through them let's go let's stress test them if let's say we're talking four or five years from now and the exit cap rate actually is a seven cap, which like to me is like absolutely bash it, you know, like absolutely insane. Uh, because you, you know, we can't build housing yet. like like if that's the exit cap rate, like nothing's gonna get, get built, right? Nothing's gonna get built ever again in, in that sense. So that's a pretty draconian and all the private guys, like when that debt comes due, like they're they're gonna have like to give the keys back to the bank, like for the most part, right? That's that's the world that we exist, right? The IRR in our model for something like a Camden or Mid America will be about somewhere between eight to nine percent. Like so it, it just yeah. so right now, a, a yeah. lot of these guys we, we're buying them at a seven percent cap rate. And what you're saying yeah. is, hey, if we exit five years from now at a seven percent cap rate, yeah. the IRR is eight and a half to nine yeah. percent, which you know that is basically the IRR for equities over the long term, right? Yes. So you're saying, hey, with what you think is pretty draconian assumptions, because as you said, at 7% cap rates, unless something changes a lot, like literally nothing's going to get built, right? So yep. we, we will have a, a lot of yep. NOI growth on the back end. You would do pretty well at this point. You, you'd you kind of I mean, obviously better. Yeah. I mean, that's not what I shoot for when I make my real estate investments, but like given like if that's the exit scenario right and, and like let's break down like where why why that is right because because like we're getting in at a free cash flow yield of like six and a half percent uh roughly right um you're getting like your 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 kind of like four three four four in dividends so you, you're taking that you're putting it in your pocket and then you know like we're modeling rent to actually like net operating income to actually go down about two percent next year and then they increase so, so like we're only modeling one percent NOI KR between now and the next four years, right? Like, fairly draconian stuff, right? And, and like, I, I feel comfortable if we say in this environment, rent growth, like, you know, post 2026 could very easily be like 4% a year for like a really long time, right? Um, so, you know, there is a little bit of leverage, right? There is a little bit of leverage, like there's like 20% leverage, right? And then there's like asset appreciation. There's there's going to be like cash built. You know, they, these companies do develop their own projects, right? So you, you have NOI growth from the internal development you know, of some projects, right? And like you, you kind of look because like you're, you're buying a six and a half, you know, you get a little bit of growth. You get, you have a little bit of, you know, like 20%, you know, 20% leverage. And that's how you get to like kind of eight, 9% IOR, right? And if like, because you're buying at like a seven, one or seven, two in MAA, like you actually got a tiny little bit of cap rate compression. Like, you know, some, some of the other ones, like you don't, right? Uh, but like, here's the thing. It wasn't that long ago when multifamily cap rates were three and a half percent, four percent, like you know, like like you know, the, like I've shown you a chart from CBRE. A lot of these multifamily, you know, in the past, you know, decade and a half, trade at like you know low force cap rate, right? So we're not going to use low force. If we use a five percent, like a five percent exit cap rate at today's price on a four year hold, you're getting total return of like 18, 19, you know, twenty percent. Like Andrew, what is not great about like like here's the thing, okay? You go buy MLPs. All right. I, I don't know how much like land there is. I don't know like like I don't know how much like oil and gas is there underneath it. I don't know like, you know, what's gonna happen to to oil and gas in 10, 20 years, right? But I do know people need a place to live, right? And and if anything, like we're not building a lot of single family homes either, right? Like th there's there's like we're chronically like, you know, we chronically have like a housing shortage in the US. Like I, I'm very confident that 50 years from now. People still need to, you know, like like the, these assets are not going to become obsolete. Like, you know, like the office, right? Like, I don't know what the office looked like in in twenty years, right? But like, I know with multifamily, like people will still need the multifamily. Like, the terminal risk is so low here. We kind of went through the GFC, like how much did NOI decrease, right? Like five percent. Like, I mean, what other asset class gives you that kind of like like if, if you if you look at multifamily and you you like remove like real estate and multifamily from it, right? And you say you get to buy an asset that has, you know, 
sixty percent EBITDA margin. Like what kind of multiple, right? Like you get sixty percent EBITDA margin, and EBITDA only drops five percent during GFC. Like what's a right multiple for a business like that, right? So, so like like we 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 so like you're, you're underwriting to somewhere between like a eight to nine percent to like a twenty percent IR, like in a very draconian to like a normal exit assumption right you're, you're getting paid to wait right and let's say we buy it and it it and shares go down by tw another 20 percent. guess what like in in that environment your ir like on a four or five year cycle actually improves by one percent ir like we run that analysis right like in a way you want to buy this you kind of want it to like sell off because you could kind of create your own tax inefficient buyback, right? So there's your answer, Andrew. You want buybacks? You got the dividends. You could do the buyback yourself, right? No, and, it, yeah, it, it's certainly true. I I, I do <laughs> I do like you say like you you want it to go down because you know we all want. It, it's funny when stocks are going up, we're all like, God, I just can't wait for the twenty percent pullback. And you know, yeah. just judging by my Twitter feed and maybe yeah. somewhat my own personal internal, I was like, when the twenty percent pullback comes, you're like. God damn it. I hate this. <laughs> this is the worst. But it is true. And like one of the interesting things that it, not to get too wonky, neither of us are tax advisors, but as you said, like I, I, I think people are worried, oh, what if interest rates go up more and the stocks go down? It's like, okay, yes, that can happen. Yeah. I, I don't think that changes any of the long-term mass bills doing it. It's, it's actually going to probably make the supply side worse on the back end. But yeah. one of the great things about that is let's say you went and you're like Avalon based my play. You know, yeah. I, I I'm just choosing them. Yeah. Home, I, I love the properties. I get a little bit of New York exposure. I think New York's going to come back. Love the management team. Stock goes down 20%. One of the great things which you could not do in, in private markets, but you could do yeah. public market, you'd be like, you know what? Yeah. Taking the short term loss and I'm throwing it over to EQR. Like, and again, not yeah. tax advice, but that, that's yeah. a, a very common strategy. That's something that you, you know you don't get when you're in the public. Last question, and then we'll wrap it up. I I wanted to go into individual stocks, but it, we're running long, and I think we have like address a few individual ones. And you know what? People can reach out to you and get the, the full spiel if they want it. Let's just I mentioned a lot of different things in this podcast, yeah. and if I tip myself on the back, I thought about it. I thought this was going to be a fun podcast, and I've really enjoyed it. But I think I asked some great questions. If I can tip myself on the back, oh, you yeah, great when questions. You, yeah. you're, you're putting this together, right? Yeah. What do you think is the overarching reason like this kind of opportunity exists? Are people just burned out on real estate? Are people really worried about the interest rates? Do people just not understand the private to public market math? Like, what do you think is the overarching reason that's uh, getting this reason? Because I have my suspicions, but I, I'm really curious to hear yours. I think that, the, the, the personal opinion, right? Like, I think that, you know, like, if you want some bill exposure, like the, the, some of that near term supply, right? And, and like, how many times have we shared an idea? People are like, yeah, but I don't want to like buy in front of that. Like, if I know that there's all this, you know, the supplies coming, like you have a supply situation for the next like, you know, 12 to 24 a month, like, do I really want to buy it? And, and my take is like, look, at a seven cap, I'll, I'll, I'll buy it, right? And, and the dividend, right? The dividend. And, and, and this is like, this is like, you know, so much of like what Buffett says is like, know what an asset is worth, right? Like know what an asset is worth, but like not every market participant, like, it, you know, like thinks that way. I get a lot of sell side uh, research notes and they're like, stick to the coastal, right? Stick to the coastal. There's like less of a supply issue, right? Uh, you don't want any sunbelt exposure right now. Um, and uh, so, so I, I think that's a big reason. And I think also people, people's memories are kind of like short term, like, like there's probably the guys who were kind of running around saying the 10 year was at, you know, uh, 1%, you could buy, you know, the public reads trading at three and a half, like that's a 250 bit spread over the 10 year, right? Like that's justified. Or probably the same people say, you know what, at like, you know, when the 10 years at four, eight, you know, these reads deserve to trade at a seven because it's about 220 bips spread over, over the 10 year, right? Like, you know, I'm like, hey, I'd rather like to buy in at like, you know, like double the absolute cap rate. I'd rather buy in on an absolute basis at a seven cap versus three and a half because it gives me the option that only if interest rate do go down, if, he, you know, if this fear goes down, like, you know, when you're near zero, there's not a lot that you could, you know, like there, there's not a lot of like cap rate compression left, right? Like when you're starting at seven, there's a lot of option that way on future cap rate compression. It, what do you think? I'd be curious. Yeah. It, do yep. you think about interest rate hedges at all here? Because I, I personally, actually, I kind of think interest rates have, people have lost their minds a little bit. And if, if you yep. put a gun to my head, I'd say, hey, I, I really don't want to make this bet. But if you put a gun to my head, I'd actually guess that long-term rates 
come down. Like as you and I are talking where it feels to me like when you've got the CNBC headline, like every day interest rates going up again, like yeah. it feels to me like you're, you're due for a little bit of a reversal, but I don't want to take that bet. Do you think about interest rate hedging here at all, just to kind of isolate the bet? Um, I mean, so, <laughs> so, and, and we've written about this like in early 2022, right? So like we we're like one, like, like, you know, we actually shorted, that um, going into 2022, like 35% of our portfolio was actually short fixed income, right? Uh, short, like like we, we were short TLT at $150. Like, you know, we covered 150. I mean, that's gone down to like 85. It's gone down. So we, we were short like very long-term uh, corporate bonds. Like like I know- I, I remember some logistics, uh, some logistics and warehouse assets that we talked about. I won't name yeah. them individually, yeah. but you were like, hey, these are trading at 2% caps, like yeah. way above replacement value. Like it, this makes no sense. Yeah. So yeah, those two. Yeah. So so like like we like I, I think when you invest in REITs, like if you don't think you're in the interest rate game, like you, you may get a rude awakening one day, right? right. Like every with stocks, it turns out, right? <laughs> yeah. That was all. My yeah. my issue with it always with yeah. stocks, not REITs, because REITs are yeah. very much interest. My interest, yeah. my issue with stocks was yeah. if you short TLT, choose right, yeah. Yeah. and you go into a crisis, you actually have the worst of both worlds. Because what's going to happen? Interest rates are going to drop and stocks are going to drop. So yeah. you're going to lose money on your TLT short and you're going to lose money on your stocks. And that's the absolute worst of all worlds. Whereas, you know, I, I always did think, hey, you know, if interest rates go up, stocks probably go down because interest rates are financial gravity. It's yeah. just a tough trade to play. And that is not REIT specific. REITs are yeah. very interest rate sensitive. So you could probably make that work. But yeah. on the stock side, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. No, I think last year was the first year where both stocks dropped and the 10 year treasury. Like, like if you, cause like, you know, I, I believe it was Ray Dalio who was like famous for like going into 2008, right? Like, it, like that 60 40 allocation. And, and, you know, I think I, I don't even know what that strategy is called, but like, you know, the 10 year, the 10 year portfolio really outperformed, but for a lot of drawdown on the equity. And last year was one of those really weird, bizarre years where that strategy didn't work because your 10 year, your tank, like your, your treasuries, like, backfired as well right like if anything the tlt drawdown i think may actually have been more the 20th treasury etf like drawdown has actually been more than the uh s p 500 last year which is like a very very uh you know weird dynamic. but like it, you know like i so first is at seven cap i don't care about interest rates anymore right like 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 if interest rates were to go up right so, so like, it, I, I don't think you need to have a strong interest rate opinion, right? Now, if you ask Bill, do you have an interest rate opinion? I would say that if you look, you know, there, there's a, I, I want to get a shout out to Adam Potenkin, right? Like, well, maybe you should get him pod one day. Uh, he, I, I've tried. I, I've okay. tried to have him on. Maybe okay. one day I'll, I'll send this to him and be like, hey, listen to, Adam's yeah. a mutual friend of ours. Like, hey, listen to Bill, listen all the way through because we, we were mm. trying to get you on. Yeah. So Adam has shown me some research where like you look at the what fees into um, the CPI. Right. And 40 percent of it. Now, Adam, Adam could explain this way better than I do. Right. 40 percent of what fees into CPI is actually uh, housing is actually housing. Right. So like so like on one hand, like I'm sitting here, I'm like, I know there's a lot of supply coming like, you know, uh, on the multifamily front. So 40%, you know, that's like single family and also uh, also like on the rental side, right? Like it's a combination. I'm like, I know 40% of it is actually got to go like flattish or or like even maybe trend down a little bit. So like if you look at, if you just like, if you, if you know like the CPI number, 40% of it is got to be like zero, maybe like negative one to like positive one, like feeding into it for the like next two years. Like I would like like on a probability basis i think that i think that like the um you know the odds of like the cpi like getting to a range where the fed is comfortable like is actually pretty good right well i i you know my my issue with the calls for this have generally yeah. been i i don't even think this is a controversial opinion to be honest yeah. with you like i do understand for a while like 2022 summer people were like oh we've completely lost control but like a lot of as you said like the housing stuff comes in on a lag and not just in terms of the supply, but even yep. the way the Fed runs it comes in yep. on a lag. And, yep. uh, you know, yeah, there's going to be energy, but the healthcare stuff. And yeah, I just I, I just don't even think it's controversial opinion. You can look at like the real time CPI stuff and we're, we're yep. down to two, two and a half percent. And yep. I'll tell you this. It does. 
it, it does kind of feel like we're hitting recession right now. Like some of the yeah. real time indicators seem like they have hit a wall. Like yeah. if you get a recession, guess what? Not only I think CPI is already solved, but CPI is really solved if you start having some slack, but probably yeah. neither here near that. Anyway, Bill, I actually am going to have to hop in a second. So I, I'm going to wrap it up here. Fourth appearance, Bill, this has been great. This is actually, I, I will tell you, it's been one of the most fun and entertaining podcasts I, I've done. All, all my podcasts are like my children, my current non-existent children i love them yeah. but it's a ton yeah. of fun really appreciate you coming on and looking forward to having you on again in the near future oh and i'll include a link to bill's twitter handle uh, in the show notes so if it, does that work so people can just dm you if they want to kind of get yeah the yeah you did, uh, and, also, everything. Yep. and also like if, if if people want to get in touch with me my email is bill at rhizomepartners.com that's uh bill at r-h-i-z-o-m-e uh partners.com uh you Perfect. know DMs are open, emails open. Love. To Don't chat even with need people. the Twitter DM. Can get there directly. But yeah, again, Bill is deep and heavy into the real estate. So if you're interested in the opportunity, you probably should reach out to him. Talk a little bit more about it. Anyway, Bill had a great time. This is yep. a ton of fun. We'll chat See soon. You. Okay. Yep. A quick disclaimer: nothing on this podcast should be considered investment advice. Guests or the hosts may have positions in any of the stocks mentioned during this podcast. Please do your own work and consult a financial advisor. Thanks.